Fast food employees in New York City demand higher pay amidst a national debate over increasing the minimum wage. As companies make record profits, what's behind the resistance to increasing pay for those earning the least? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. I'm Shihab Ritansi. Last week in New York City, hundreds of fast food workers walked off their jobs demanding higher wages and improved benefits. Many of them earned the federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. New York State has recently approved an increase in the minimum wage to $9 an hour by the year 2016. But for a full-time worker, that still would only mean a yearly income of $18,000 in a city where the living wage for one adult is estimated at $26,500. In response to the protests, McDonald's issued a statement saying it treats its employees with dignity and respect while offering competitive wages. Employees, however, say the company is simply ignoring their demands. We are your crew. We are generating your profits. You are making the profits. And we are asking you to respect us with $15 benefits, a union, job security. We need your help. And we're asking you, but we've been asking you, and it seems like you're not listening. So we're asking you again. And we're repeating it and repeating it until you do listen. And we're going to keep coming and coming until you listen. This comes at a time when there is a wider debate across the United States over whether the federal minimum wage should be increased. Opponents to any rise say it would be a job killer. But supporters say it's necessary to help the country's lowest paid climb out of poverty and to get the U.S. economy moving again. Earlier, we spoke to one of the organizers of the New York City strikes, Jonathan Weston. This is the second time last week that hundreds of workers across New York City in the fast food industry went out on a strike uh, demanding living wages, $15 an hour, and the rights to organize um, without retaliation. And workers have been organizing um, around the fact that they continue to live in poverty. They, you know, many of the workers work off of $7.25 an hour, um, and in some cases folks are working these jobs for 15, 20 years um, and still making about the same rate. Um, people continue to live in poverty while working, getting as many hours as they possibly can, making $7.25 an hour, and living in the most expensive city in U.S., um, New York City, they, they can't afford the basic necessities of life. They can't afford rent. They can't afford to even put food on the table, and in many cases, not even the hamburgers that they're serving, they can't even afford. Uh, you talk about fear of retaliation. Has there been retaliation for these, for these labor actions? Yeah, so uh, workers, the first public action workers um, did was in November when uh, about 200 workers went out on strike within the fast food industry. And since that time, uh, the, the corporations and managers and bosses at many of the restaurants have been holding closed doors meetings with workers, you know, telling them that uh, it's not in their favor to continue organizing, to continue demanding better wages, and that um, they shouldn't be doing it. Um, you know, and intimidating workers. And even in the face of, um, you know, the corporate retaliation on workers to not organize, workers have even have grown their numbers. They've increased the number of people within uh, the number of stores that uh, people have been involved within the campaign. And I think workers have shown that um, not only are they not going away, but they're uh, going to continue growing this movement of workers uh, who are living uh, in poverty off of the wages that these corporations that are making billions and billions of profits continue to pay people. What about the argument that, especially at a time of economic downturn, these low-wage jobs provide some kind of safety net at least for people, and if, if the minimum wage goes up, then those jobs won't be available? Mm -hmm. Well, that's actually just not true. Uh, these corporations are making record profits. Literally after the recession, they are making some of the most profits they have ever made. And while these corporations are recovering, the workers in communities and low-income communities um, around uh, New York City and around the country are not recovering. And the only real path to recovery for workers is to actually give them the living wages that they need to live off of. And that will actually be the full economic recovery instead of just the recovery for the people at the top, because that's what we're seeing right now. 
What's the strategy moving forward? Are you attempting to create a kind of broad-based coalition nationwide? Yeah, so you know, workers decided to strike um, on April 4th last week, which was the anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination, where he was supporting striking sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee, who were actually demanding the exact same things that workers were uh, demanding in New York uh, in the fast food industry last week, living wages and the rights to organize without retaliation. And I think in many cases, the, the, the campaign is really about continuing to build um, workers and get involvement within the campaign, but also to build a broader economic movement within New York City and around the country around wages that are continually paid to folks that keep them in poverty. And when these are the way, these are the jobs uh, that we have in this economy, and th this is what the economy is becoming. If we don't find a real way to lift people up out of poverty within this work, um, that um, we won't continue to reduce the economic inequality in this country. And it's really building the broader economic inequality movement and what MLK was calling the poor people's movement of lifting people out of poverty and into the middle class. And I think that's what workers wanted to get across um, last week, and I think that's what they did. But it's not just about wages, though. It is about conditions and about the nature of, of work. And I mean, to what extent do you feel that the, the sort of mechanisms we see in low-wage jobs are beginning to make themselves felt in higher-paid jobs? Well, the, I, think, I think what's happening, I mean, we saw this with the, the Walmart strikes that happened last year as well, too. We are becoming an economy of low-wage service sector work. When you know, many of the manufacturing jobs that were, you know, used to be some of the best-paying uh, jobs for middle-class folks uh, are leaving this country and being, you know, shipped out overseas. I mean, the jobs that are left in this country now are service sector jobs that the only people that can do these jobs are the people here in this country. And I think what we see is uh, workers understanding that if these, if these jobs don't continue to, you know, elevate you and get you out of poverty and there's nothing else that's out there, that we have to create some change. And I think that's what workers have been demanding. And that's what uh, a lot of this worker movement has been in the country over the past several months. Joining us in the studio, Jack Temple, a policy analyst at the National Employment Law Project, an organization which advocates for the rights of lower wage workers. Also with us, Nicole Woop, Director of Domestic Policy at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Jack, let me begin with you. Um, sure. Fast food workers is a sector that's, that's quite interesting because even, at least from the coverage, even some of those who, who claim to be liberal and progressive say, look, this is kind of weird and you shouldn't distort fa the fast food sector by paying people with no skills too much money. Is that an argument you hear quite often and, and what's your response? Well, I would say, you know, the fast food workers in New York City, what we heard last week, are calling for a $15 an hour minimum wage. Um, and I think some historical perspective is important. And so, for example, in the late 1960s, the federal minimum wage in today's dollars was actually equal to almost $11 an hour. It's about $10.67 per hour. And it's only because uh, the four decades afterwards were followed by congressional neglect, allowing the minimum wage to remain stagnant for decade periods at a time, even as the cost of living continued to rise, that the purchasing power of the minimum wage was really lost uh, to a great deal, and so we're only at $7.25 today. So the call for $15 an hour is really, to a large extent, just calling for recovering the lost value of the minimum wage that we've seen over the last four decades. And beyond that, it's just reconciling the sort of base labor standard with what we recognize as the reality of the cost of living in New York. Well, we'll, um, we'll get into some more of that national picture in, sure. in a moment, but specifically about fast food mm -hmm. workers. Actually, I wonder whether the fundamentals of the fast food corporations are quite instructive because there's quite a disparity between worker pay and company profits. Right. According to Bloomberg, the median earnings for a fast food worker is approximately $18,000 a year. Right. Meanwhile, McDonald's, for example, has seen a 135% profit increase between 2007 and 2011, and their highest paid executive made $8.8 .8 million in um, 2011. Uh, Yum Brands, which operates several fast food restaurants, including Taco Bell and Pizza Hut, saw a 45% increase in profits between 2007 and 2011, and their highest paid executive made $20.4 million in, in 2011. How much of that profitability, Jack, then, is based on the sort of low wages that 
are being protested against and how much of a hit might the profitability take there if, if they do raise the wages? Right. Well, I think, um, you know, what's clear is that their profits, they've made a decision to drive their profits overwhelmingly by paying low wages because we know that employers have choice, even within the fast food industry. Um, in and out Burger is a popular fast food chain along the West Coast. Their entry-level employees um, make well over $10 per hour today. And so, and the company is incredibly successful and very popular with, cu with customers as well. Talk to anyone on the West Coast. So uh, what we've seen is that um, the sort of fast food chains like McDonald's, um, like Pizza Hut, the, the Young Brands own companies, have just made a decision. They're, they're going to be profitable and they're going to do so by paying low wages. But, um, you know, if they were to imitate more like companies like in and out Burger, other fast food chains, other high road employers like Costco, what we know is that they could remain profitable, actually earn very strong profits, be more productive and still pay their employees fair wages. And a federal minimum wage wouldn't necessarily affect them. I mean, because it's not as if they have to. They they would, you know, they would say, okay, well then we're not, we're just going to forget about the U.S. market completely and 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 close down all their shops. I suppose. Well, the thing is, you know, with with service industry, uh, with service industry uh, companies like like Walmart, like uh, you know the fast food chains like McDonald's, they have to remain close to their customers. They have a U.S. customer base that actually the U.S. economy, seventy percent of which is driven by consumer demand, and so these employers need to remain close to their customers. And raising wages would just ensure that their employees actually have enough to buy the product that they're selling each day. All right, we'll develop that thought in a moment too. Sure. But Nicole, I mean, Jack touched on then the um, on how much the minimum wage, as it stands, seven twenty-five an hour, uh, how it compares historically in real terms to, to, to previous times. Um, and it doesn't look that good then when you, when you, when you put it in its, in its historical context right now. No, that's right. It's lost about 30% of its value since 1968 if you just look at inflation. There's a lot of other ways to look at it, though. For example, productivity, how much workers make per hour. That's increased far, far faster than inflation. And if uh, the minimum wage had kept up with productivity, it could be above $21 an hour. And that's still, you know, about $40,000 a year, which is, I think, for most Americans, what they would think is pretty much the basic, uh, e basic budget for a family of, let's say, four. But, and we should remember, though, that different states have different minimum yes, wages, too, though. Yes. So, and, so, and Washington State goes up to $9.19, mm -hmm. I suppose. And again, clearly, that those aren't even close to historical historical averages either of them. Right. They're not up to it yet. There are about 19 states that currently have a minimum wage that's higher than the federal, and about 10 of those actually index their wages to inflation so that it would rise with inflation. One of the problems that Jack was mentioning is that every now and then Congress does increase the minimum wage, but they have failed to link it to inflation, so it just keeps falling further behind right after they pass. But, but surely they the know that. What's the reason for not being indexed to inflation? Has it ever been made clear? Is that part of the economic ideology perhaps underpinning this debate? Yeah, I think, you know, overwhelmingly, I think progress on the federal level, when we're talking about the federal minimum wage, is driven by the state level. So we've seen 10 states already adopt indexing for the minimum wage. I think the more states that adopt indexing and show that this is a really smart and economically responsible policy, then we're going to see it happen on the federal level as All well. All right, well, let's, let's get then to, to the national debate that's underway. President Obama spoke out uh, in favor of the minimum wage to be raised, although just to what, $9, $9 per hour, which again is nowhere near perhaps a living wage. Uh, but here's his argument in the State of the Union address. Mm -hmm. Let's declare that in the wealthiest nation on earth, no one who works full time should have to live in poverty and raise the federal minimum wage to $9 an hour. We should be able to get that done. This single step would raise the incomes of millions of working families. It could mean the difference between groceries or the food bank, rent or eviction, scraping by or finally getting ahead. For businesses across the country, it would mean customers with more money in their pockets. And a whole lot of folks out there would probably need less help from government. In fact, working folks shouldn't have to wait year after year for the minimum wage to go up while CEO pay has never been higher. So, so there then, Jack, he, he, President Obama seems to be referring to this, this multiplier effect, that mm -hmm. actually raising the minimum wage has a great effect on all sorts of other factors, the GDP, the tax base, reducing poverty, and also on 
government spending, the amount that the government has to shut out for Medicaid and food stamps and sure, other things. Right, right? Exactly. I mean, is, is there a broad consensus on that? Well, in the economic research, yes. So um, after the president called for raising the minimum wage, congressional Democrats introduced the Fair Minimum Wage Act of 2013, which would raise the federal minimum wage to $10.10 per hour. It also boosts the tip minimum wage and, like we were talking about earlier, index the minimum wage to rise with the cost of living. And had that been passed, ha if that's passed uh, this year, it'll generate about $30 billion in new economic activity, raise the wages of roughly 30 million low-paid workers uh, in the country. And so this is something that the, the economic literature makes very clear. When you put more money in the hands of low-paid workers, they often have no choice but to spend it immediately. And it goes to the local small businesses. It goes to grocery stores. It goes to places like, like McDonald's or Target. And so this is exactly the kind of stimulus that our, uh, that our economy needs right now. Um, so this was the argument then that House Speaker John Boehner put forward in response to Barack Obama's call for a rise in the minimum wage. I've got 11 brothers and sisters on every rung of the economic ladder. Uh, I know about th this issue of, as much as anybody in this town. And what happens when you take away the cu first couple of rungs on the economic ladder, you make it harder for people to get on the ladder. Our goal is to get people on the ladder and help them climb that ladder so they can live the American dream. And, and, and a lot of people who are being paid the minimum wage are being paid that because they come to the workforce with no skills. And this makes it harder for them to acquire the skills they need in order to climb that ladder successfully. Right. So, Nicole, that argument then seems to be uh, having a higher minimum wage will mean an end to the sort of low-skilled jobs that at least get those without skills onto the economic ladder in the first place. And once you, you're basically pricing them out of the market and the economic workforce in perpetuity, and that's going to be a huge problem in the future then. Well, this touches on what Jack was saying, that most of these low-wage jobs are service jobs, and we really can't do without people who are you know, cleaning hotels or uh, taking care of our elderly in nursing homes. These are not jobs that we can just export or just get rid of completely. People have to so, do... So they're not in work. danger of being lost, then, is, is the argument? There might be really. some, you know, there might be a very small amount of job loss, but actually we have economy... This is actually one of the... Um, uh, questions that's been studied more than any in, in economics, and there have been thousands of studies. They show almost no effect. If there's any effect, it's very minuscule and tiny. And if there's uh, slightly less hours being worked by some of these workers, the increase in the minimum wage in general would um, increase their overall pay to uh, you know, a greater extent, so they would still benefit from it. And, and it's not bad reminding ourselves, Jack, as to which sectors of the economy employ most people at the minimum wage, and it isn't it isn't the mom and pop stores. No, in fact, um, 70, nearly 70% 70 of all low-wage workers across the country are employed by large companies with over 100 employees. And the largest of those employers, the Walmarts, the McDonald's, the places we've been referring to, have been profitable every year in the post-recession recovery and are actually earning higher profits today. What about the effect on the mom and pop stores, though? Is that where you know, things might get contentious? Though? Yeah, I mean, by and large, I think there are two ways to think about it. So first of all, we recognize that you know small businesses, they often employ their neighbors or people that they know around town. They're, they're invested in their workforce and they're invested in their workers. And there's smart economic reasons for that. So paying higher wages, for example, results in sharp reductions in employee turnover, which is a high cost for businesses. You have to recruit new employees, retrain new employees. That's a big cost and a big waste for employees, uh, for employers. And so paying higher wages really cuts that down. And that's the business model that not only small businesses, but also places like Costco have, have really um, you know, pioneered and shown that can be incredibly successful. And you get sharp increases in worker productivity as a result as well. Um, Nicole, is it clear though, because this does seem, this is a, partly a stumbling block I think actually, it seems mm -hmm. counterintuitive for those who are brought up on notions of supply and demand to say look you can increase wages uh, and yet you won't increase demand then for workers because clearly theoretically then you're making them, you know, you're, pr you're pricing them out of the market perhaps. Well, so so what, is there a clear a clear explanation of why then it doesn't have an impact on the employment market. I, I think a big part of it is that workers are also customers, right? The workers who are getting paid are also the people who are buying things in their local businesses. And the best way to keep the economy going and making it healthy is by making sure that workers have more money to spend. And so, you know, by raising the wages, the uh, restaurants and the stores in their community will do well as also. And I actually did some of the primary research on a living wage um, uh, study um, for Baltimore, and we talked to you know small business owners who had gone through the change from a regular wage to a higher living wage in Baltimore, 
And they said to us, as long as it's an even playing field and all of our competitors have to pay the same floor, it really doesn't affect us, us, us that badly. And they also said, we care about our workers. These were small business workers. We've grown to be like family with them. And we want them to be able to pay for their kids to have a new pair of shoes or, you right. know, get health care or whatever but, but it is. is there really consensus? Because again, I think, I mean, it seems like in the 70s, the consensus seemed to be a, a, a minimum wage would harm employment uh, negatively. And then over the last 20 years, we've seen loads of studies basically suggesting, using specific time periods in right. specific states sure. saying, okay, look, this is what happened. There wasn't a problem. I think in Texas, you know, even there was an improvement in employment and so in, in the early 90s. Right. Um, and yet, um, there was a survey of 40 leading economists. You know, there's this thing called the Initiative on Global Markets, it's called. And they sort of, they poll liberal and, and conservative leading economists, they say. 34% said it would make it harder for lower skilled workers to gain employment, having a minimum wage. Uh, but then having said that, though, 32% said, no, it wouldn't. But then 24% were uncertain. You see? Mm -hmm. So that's why, again, I wonder how strong this consensus is and whether for all of the studies that you're citing, actually, that, that you know, perhaps presumably this, at the very least, this 34% can, prove to, can point to some empirical evidence that minimum wages do harm employment prospects. Well, I think the important thing to remember is there may have been a, a, a consensus in the past that, um, you know, on the relationship between minimum wage and, and job loss, but it was guided by theory. And I think what we've gotten over the past 20 years is a lot of evidence to actually show us what really does happen. Over the past 20 years, we've had a record number of states that actually acted in the U.S. to raise their minimum wage. And and so we've had these great natural experiments to compare what happens in states with higher wages to those with non-higher wages, to those that leave the minimum wage the same. And across the board, the most rigorous research makes very clear that businesses have been able to afford the types of minimum wage increases that have been passed uh, over the past 20 years. And so, you know, in, it, what it just shows is that the economy is actually more complex than what we might pick up in Econ 101. But, but that's one they're... of the reasons why um, some, uh, Professor Richard Wolff is a good example, he's a pro you know, progressive, I think, perhaps even self self-proclaimed communist, actually economist, uh, who says, look, th there's too many variables to really make that definite um, empirical conclusion uh, that a minimum wage doesn't affect uh, employment. So change it from an economic discussion simply to a political, social and ethical discussion, actually, as to what sort of society we want. Maybe that's the, be the best starting point rather than an economic debate. Is that helpful at all? I think, I think, though, I mean, I, I totally agree we can get lost in the morass of what the studies show, and regardless of what the consensus, I do think some common sense factors should point us in the right direction and show that businesses can afford higher wages. Precisely the data I was showing about the profits of low-wage employers, the fact that uh, higher wages are correlated with reductions in turnover and increases in productivity, these sort of basic facts, um, you know, the fact that small businesses are really only a minority of the large, large uh, low-wage employers. Um, I, there's one question that, that, that sort of bugged me a little bit looking up, you know, reading up about this, is how we settled on this concept of a minimum wage when clearly a minimum wage is so different from a living wage. Was, has it always been like that? And why isn't the living wage then the minimum standard you know, that we would require an employer to pay? That's a good question. When the minimum wage was first passed uh, 75 years ago, it was a, at about half of the median wage in America. Now it's down about a third or 30 percent. And that's why sometimes we like to cite things like if the minimum wage were at you know half the median wage, it would be up around, again, close to $11 an hour. And so it, there has been a shift. The lower wage workers are, have been falling behind. There's been a larger and larger gap. And again, economic studies have shown that a lot of that is due to the minimum wage. But, not but isn't it time to, to change the frame of reference away from a minimum wage, which seems a little arbitrary given you know, the cost of living, basically, mm -hmm. they, they, it was. Well, the minimum wage, I mean, we could imagine it really reconciling with the cost of living. Right. I think uh, the, the, the most urgent step we can take right now is just to recover the lost value. I think we could then have a conversation about what the next steps are for raising wages in the economy, specifically with low-wage jobs growing where they are. I mean, you made that um, distinction between um, ideology and theory and and the empirical evidence. Mm -hmm. on, on the day that Mrs. Thatcher died, I wonder whether there is that argument there that this is about a particular vision of society and notions of what competitiveness and economic efficiency and flexibility for corporations are and how important that is. And, and whether that a big part of that, though, is keeping, uh, keeping wages as low as possible and, and allowing corporations to do what they want with wages and indeed keeping benefits low as possible to, to give them that economic flexibility, which is a term that isn't often 
mm -hmm. is an often question, or at least hasn't been since the Thatcher-Reagan revolutions. Kind of. Right. I do think, though, that, I mean, what the data makes clear is that over 70 percent of Americans support raising the minimum wage. And so I think this has less to do with competing ideologies and a lot more with the role of corporate spending in our political system. Low-wage employers across the board have lobbied very heavily over the last 30 years to keep the minimum wage where it's at, to delay action on this. The voters want it and legislate, including a majority of all Republicans in the country. And so legislators have every reason to respond and to raise the minimum wage. But it's, it's less to do with uh, a difference in ideology and more to do with the realities of political spending in our, in our country. I mean, going to John Boehner's point, he's talking about taking rungs off the economic ladder. The idea that somehow keeping wages at a rock bottom level is good for economic opportunity just doesn't pass the smell test. So, Jack Temple, thank you very much. Uh, Nicole Wu, thank you very much as well. And that's it from the team in Washington, D.C. for now. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook where you can find more information about the program. And we want to hear from you. Share your ideas with us on Twitter. Our handle is AJ Inside Story AM.